the privilege today to introduce our speaker, um, which I'm really excited about. I've known her for several years now, and her husband has been a teacher for all my kids, I think. Um, but Diane is a, a great woman of God, and I really respect her faith. I respect her as a wife and a mom, and um, I'm looking forward to what she has for us today. So give a good welcome for Diane. Okay, so can you hear me? Okay. <laughs> um, before we get started, I'm going to tell you how I ended up up here this morning. <laughs> um, so my name's Diane Baird. If I haven't met you before, it's great to kind of meet you, I guess. Um, and if you know me at all, you know I'm kind of an introvert, and I really hate getting up here. Um, but I went to talk to back Pastor Brian a few weeks ago, and then... This is where I ended up. So, um, Diane, and I am totally terrified to be up here. Um, if you want to go to the next slide. But um, I'm here anyway. <laughs> so, before we get started, I'm going to pass around two clipboards because I'm here to talk about refugees and what God has to say about um, refugees and immigrants. Um, and the refugee crisis. A lot of people have seen things on the news, but you maybe don't know a lot about it, or you maybe only heard what's on the news. So um, Pastor Brian wanted me to talk about that this morning, so here I am. Um, but the organization that I used to work for that has refugee kids that, that come unaccompanied and live with foster parents um, has an event coming up in July, and they could use some help. So there's a service opportunity for us, for anybody that would like to. Um, to donate some food or some graduation gifts. There are six gra kids graduating from high school this year um, out of about 60 kids in the program. About half the kids in the program have already graduated from high school and are in their older teen years. So um, it's kind of a cool opportunity to celebrate if anybody would like to go or to grill food um, or help set up and clean up. That's going to be at Hawk Island Park. So if anybody's interested, I'm going to send these around. It's going to be in Lansing. Okay. So, um, we will pass the, it's on July 21st, and I know that's during the week, and probably not a lot of people are available, but we will pass the clipboard around again next week, um, and after that, we'll make a plan with what we have and go from there, um, in case anybody wants to be involved. So I have worked with refugees for over 20 years. Um, I worked with St. Vincent Catholic Charities in Lansing, a refugee resettlement organization, for three years, and then with Samaritas Lutheran Social Services of Michigan as well for the last 17. Um, so this is a topic I know a lot about. And um, I have spoken about refugees at different groups, but. I've always done it on behalf of like an organization, like I'm recruiting something, recruiting foster parents or doing something, and today I'm not. Um, I'm asking people to learn a little bit more about who refugees are, um, and then take a look of, at what God has to say about refugees in the Bible. We come to church to learn about what God wants from us and what he has to say to us, and so that's the only focus this morning. So it's kind of freeing and it's kind of terrifying um, <laughs> because I am trying to share what God wants me to share, and that's the only reason I'm up here, because if it was my choice, I would not be here um, in front of you. <laughs> so, um, But when Pastor Brian asks you to do something, and you pray about it, and you feel like God's telling you to do something, I do not want to end up in the belly of a whale like Jonah. <laughs> so here I am. <laughs> so... Um, I also want to say before we get started, Pastor Brian said a couple of weeks ago that you should come this morning and prepare to be offended by the gospel. I was like, wow, that's a little pressure, Brian. <laughs> um, and I'm not intending on inf offending anybody, if you heard that and you were freaked out like I am, um, but 
I've made some peace with those words over the last couple of weeks since Brian said them and thought, you know what? If God's word offends somebody, that's okay. I will try not to, and if I make any mistakes, I apologize. But if God's words offend you, I, I've made my peace with that. I, I guess I'm okay with that. Um, so hopefully I can just be a conduit and we'll listen to God's word. So go ahead. So this ha slide has a lot of words on it. I'm not, not sure how well you can see it, but I thought I'd start out with some myths. So what have we heard in the news about refugees? We have heard that there are more refugees than at any other time in human history. That is true. But the U.S. is not taking more refugees than we have in the past. In 1980, um, the U.S. accepted 207,000 refugees. And last year, we only accepted 85,000. This year, it's anticipated it will be around 50 or 55,000. So we are not taking more refugees as a country, even though there are more refugees around the world than there ever have been before. So you think of our history. I do like living with a history teacher. I kind of like history. It's like all okay with me. Sometimes I go on little history tangents when I speak to people, so sorry. <laughs> Hopefully you don't feel like you're in class, but... Um, after World War II, right, we had devastation across Europe and tons of refugees fleeing um, because it wasn't safe to live there anymore. So um, I went through and um, took a look at how many refugees were there after World War II and how many refugees were there at other points in time in history. Um, and we just far outstrip all of that now. Um, Another myth we've heard about refugees is that refugees hurt the economy or that it's going to be a drain to accept refugees um, into our country. And that's far from true. The facts are for refugee, every refugee or immigrant that comes into the U.S., 2.6 jobs are created. So refugees coming creates jobs. Refugees also pay back all of the money they receive in benefits by paying taxes within years of arriving in the U.S. Most refugees I have met um, that come as adults are employed within four to eight months and are no longer receiving any type of benefit or help. Um, they're taking care of themselves, paying for everything they and their family need. Um, cities experiencing positive immigration are actually experiencing economic growth. So if you look at cities around the country and who has positive immigration and who is shrinking or keeping out refugees, those that have positive immigration, their economies are on the upswing. And those that do not, their economies are on the decline. So it's really interesting to look at some of those facts. Um, I was recently, I took a new job. So I told you about the two jobs I had for most of my career, but I recently took a new job where um, I'm visiting different programs around the country to review and make sure they're doing what they're supposed to. So programs um, that work with refugees, both kids and adults. And I was in Rochester, New York, and meeting with um, an employer and um, hearing some stories from their community. And they said, you know, there was a Lunchables factory, and it was getting ready to close because they couldn't keep enough employees. Um, and they came to us, and they started hiring our refugees. And the owner said, we would have had to close if we didn't have these people coming to work because we couldn't keep people in our jobs. So with employers facing decisions like that, situations like that, where they don't have enough people to work, I mean, I guess I would want to live there, right? If they have more jobs <laughs> um, than they have people for, that's a great thing. Um, but the loss of that factory would have impacted all the other U.S. workers at that factory too, right? They would have lost their jobs if the factory left and closed. The community would have lost the tax income. The schools would have lost students because people would have had to move away to find other jobs. Um, sometimes people are worried refugees aren't going to learn English. Um, most refugees that I meet speak more languages than I do. I speak one and a half. I speak some Spanish, enough to get by, but I'm not really proficient. Um, most refugees speak two to five. I had a coworker um, who spoke six languages. Um, so they're kind of amazing in a lot of ways. Um, Certain refugee groups have more education than others. Um, those coming from Syria and Iraq in particular have high education. I worked with a woman who came when I worked at St. Vincent's 
So in probably 97, 98, she came, she was Kurdish from northern Iraq, and she was a pediatrician. Um, and coming here, her first job was interpreting for others that were coming after her. So she spoke Kurdish and Arabic, and she worked as an interpreter for medical appointments, and then ended up with a job at a hospital um, doing that interpreting full time soon after that. Another thing people hear is that refugees might be a security risk. That's a big one lately. We hear a lot about that. And there's a lot of fear about people we don't know. Um, but the security process for refugees, refugees are a tenth of 1% of all immigrants coming to the US. So if you had 100 people coming here in a year, which you know obviously the number is, it'd be 1% of that and a tenth of that. Um, but they're the most vetted. It takes 18 to 24 months to get through the security process, including five in-person interviews with Homeland Security, with other entities, with the State Department, with the United Nations and other places, biometrics. They have unnamed, like I heard the State Department talk about, they have unnamed security clearances. So it's not just the CIA and the FBI and Department of Homeland Security, but they actually have like shadow people that investigate. <laughs> that they couldn't even tell me who they were. <laughs> so that was interesting. Um, but they, I, as I was preparing for today, I looked up kind of like, what, what are people saying that's negative so I can kind of share about that and then talk about what God has to say. Um, and it was interesting, I found an article that a whole bunch of conservative um, folks signed. Throughout the history of the refugee program, there's been bipartisan support. It hasn't been a political issue, um, Democratic, Democrats and Republicans both have supported refugees coming in. But a bunch of conservative people, including Henry Kissinger, um, General Petraeus, and Michael Hayden, and a dozen others, wrote to Congress saying, refugee resettlement initiatives help advance US national security interests by supporting the stability of our allies and partners that are struggling to host large numbers of refugees. I thought that was interesting. Like, how did they come to that conclusion? Um, and the article elaborated, it's important to understand that refugees are just this tiny group that's coming to the US out of everybody that comes. Um, and they're the most highly vetted. And it's way easier to smuggle yourself in a different way. If you come on a student visa or come as a tourist or something, like there'd be a million other easier ways. Um, and secondly, that no refugee has ever killed an American in a terrorist attack since the program started in 1980. So that was good to read. Um, in that letter, they also stated um, that it's anticipated the reduction of refugees. So there was an executive order, it's been a lot in the news, right? Uh, the travel ban. Um, that also decreased the number of refugees coming from 90,000 to 50 for this year, for 2017. Um, and it's been researched, they anticipate that 5,700 fewer persecuted Christians will be allowed to come as refugees this year because of that change in number. So that weighed a little bit on me when I, when I read this. Go to the next slide. So who is a refugee? Um, so this is the UN definition, what the world signed in the Geneva Convention um, in the... Uh, 51 or so, I believe. I'm looking at my husband to see if I got the date wrong, so I didn't write the date down. He's supposed to know all that stuff, right? As a history teacher, he has to know everything. Um, but a refugee is a person who's unable to return to their home country because of past persecution, a well-founded fear of persecution based on race, religion, nationality, membership in a particular social group or political opinion. So a refugee is not an immigrant. It's not someone that chooses to come. A refugee is someone that's afraid, if I stay in my home, I will die, or be imprisoned, or be tortured, and I need to leave to save my own life. So an example of those groups, one group that we had come as refugees a, a few years ago that meets a lot of those criteria, and actually a lot of the refugees that we had come to Lansing from Burma, um, also known as Myanmar, um, identify as American Baptist denomination, which is really fascinating 
that way back a long time ago, there was this guy with the last name Judson, and he became a missionary, and he went, so there's a Judson College, and there are different things that are like within the Baptist tradition, colleges and things like that, but he was a missionary, and he went to Burma, and a bunch of people accepted Christ, and many of the people that came to Lansing anyway, that were from this group of Burmese refugees, were Christian, and we're looking for a church to go to, and so I helped them look up where were all the churches that were their denomination. We're a little too far away from Lansing to drive to. But, um, but the Burmese um, were ethnic minorities, so they were a different ethnic identity than the people in charge of the country. The country is run by the Burmans, and the minority groups that we received as refugees were Chin, Kachin, Karin, and other minority groups within that country. They also, in those groups, believe in democracy. Does anybody know much about Burma or Myanmar? So in Burma, there was an election. People wanted democracy and fought for democracy, and there was an election, and what did they do when the election got completed? They elected someone that would be a democratic leader, and they immediately put her in prison because the people in charge didn't want to lose their power. So she was in prison for over 20 years, I feel like, and, and was um, released more recently. But most of the groups that we received were fighting for democracy, and they were a minority group. They were also Christian, and the majority group in Burma is Buddhist. And so they were persecuted not only on race or ethnicity, um, their religious beliefs, and their political opinion. So they hit three out of the five criteria. You only have to meet one for the United Nations and the U.S. to recognize you as a refugee, but that group actually met three of the five criteria, and that was really interesting. Um, so some of the kids that I worked with from Burma were forced, were abducted from their homes. The military comes in and they say, okay, you guys are the able-bodied young people we're going to take you and make you build a road so that our tanks and our military equipment can get to this area. And they would use kids as slave labor, and adults as well. But I worked with kids um, when this group came. Um, other kids had their parents in prison because they were fighting for democracy, and so their mom said, you need to leave. They arrested your dad, they arrested your older brother. You are next when they come back, go gave them all the money they had, and they left on their own at the age of 14, 15, 16 to travel across one to three countries to find some place that was safe to be. And they ended up here five or six years later. So it was a long journey. It wasn't a quick journey for them to get here. But who is not a refugee? So a refugee is not an immigrant. It's not someone that chooses to come. So what we recognize as a different definition of a refugee is someone that that can't go home, it's not safe, and the United Nations tries everything when they're in a refugee camp or they have fled and they're living in an urban area, not even in a camp, the UN tries everything. Can we find your family? Can you stay here wherever you ran to? If you're from Syria and you ran to Turkey, can you stay in Turkey? Will they allow you to work? Will they allow you to live outside a refugee camp? Can you stay here? So the first option is can you go home? Second option is can you stay in Turkey? The third and last option would be resettlement to another country. And less than 1% of all refugees even get that option of being resettled in another country. I'm trying to see if I forgot anything. See, I'm like not the experienced speaker that Brian is. Sorry. <laughs> um, so let's go to the next slide. So these are the top five countries that refugees are coming from. So no real surprise. Um, uh, Africa and the Middle East are highlighted there. So the top five countries of origin that are generating refugees right now are Syria, Afghanistan, South Sudan, Sudan, and Somalia. So those are the top five countries. Refugees are actually coming from hundreds of countries throughout the world, but those are the top five at this particular moment. Um, I looked at this really cool website. If anybody like finds this topic interesting and you want to look at something really cool, I couldn't figure out how to use it in a PowerPoint, but the refugeeproject.org has a dynamic map of the world and you can click on where are refugees fleeing from and where are refugees going. So you can the whole map changes from people 
places people are leaving to places people are going to, um, depending on which little button you click. And it shows, and you can click on that more. So if you clicked on South Sudan, then it would say how many refugees are fleeing from there, um, where are they going, why are they fleeing, and it would give you more information. It was really neat. Um, technology at its best, right? Helping to explain what's going on in the world. But it goes back to 1975, and in 1975, there were a little over a million refugees, 1,203,000. Um, so in 1975, coincidentally the year I was born, um, that's the data they have tracked back to, but the big conflict that we were aware of and where we accepted refugees from soon after that was from Vietnam, right, after the Vietnam War. So we had been involved and we had allies there and so we accepted <coughs> refugees from Vietnam. But the top countries of origin for refugees at that time were Angola, Guinea, and Rwanda. So where we accepted refugees from and where the most refugees are sometimes is different. Our policies have shifted a little more over time, but um, sometimes it doesn't match the map of where, where people are fleeing. Um, but it's a cool website if anybody is interested. Um, we see a lot on the news right now about Syria. Has anybody seen much on the news about South Sudan or Somalia? No, we don't, we don't see that on the news. We don't see everything. While Syrians are the largest group that are currently refugees, the, the fastest growing number is Sudan and South Sudan because they reached a little bit of stability um, when George W. Bush was president. There was a peace agreement reached, the country made a decision and said we will have a, this referendum and we'll have a vote in 10 years or five years or whatever and then we can decide if South and North are gonna split, right? And they had a vote and the South split and it was a little bit more stable and now it's more dangerous again. Fighting has broken out again. And I'm gonna tell you a story about one of my kids that went back and what's happening with him right now in a few minutes. Um, but we don't always see everything that's happening because it doesn't end up on the news. But the stories about Syria are horrific, right? When you see the videos of what's happening, your heart breaks. And if your heart doesn't break, it's because you've toughened it up so that you don't get devastated every time you turn on the news, right? Because it can be difficult to watch the news right now. Um, but what's happening in Syria is not all that different from what's happening in other parts of the world, even when it's not making the news. There may be different reasons. There may be different um, types of conflict going on, but war is happening. Persecution is happening. The refugees I've met come from really diverse backgrounds. Um, last time, so I left my old job working with refugee um, kids um, at the end of March. And at that point, we had 17 different countries of origin and at least four different religious groups among the kids that I was working with. So they come from lots of different backgrounds, not just one um, at this point. So I'm going to tell you a few stories after I show you the next slide with statistics on it, because statistics can sometimes be overwhelming and boring. So, um, so I know you can't read the little text, but the biggest number, that 65 million, is the number of people that are displaced from their homes. So if war came today to Stockbridge, if war broke out, conflict happened, and someone came to our church right now and started attacking people, and we had to leave, and we went to Williamston or Chelsea or um, Lansing or Detroit or Florida to find safety, that's the number. People who have left their homes and displaced but that includes both refugees and non-refugees, people that just left their home but didn't leave their country. So 65.6 .6 million people who've had to leave their homes because it's not safe to be there anymore, that are displaced. 22.5 million, that next number is the number of actual refugees that are recognized by the United Nations. So the number of refugees that have left their home and left their country because it's not safe for them to stay in their country. So 1.2 million in that 1975 number, 22.5 million now. It's huge. Um, 10 million stateless people. So that 10 million number is people that have no country that will claim them. 
they're a person, they can't say I'm an American, they can't say I'm a southern Sudanese that fled my home because South Sudan won't claim them, no one will claim them. For example, um, there was a group of Bhutanese that came a few years ago. Um, we had no kids from that group because they had been refugees a really long time. They left, they were kicked out of um, Bhutan in the 70s because they were ethnically from Nepal. And they had been living in the Bhutan, in this region of Bhutan for a long time. And so the Bhutanese kicked them out and said, you can't stay here, you're not our people. Um, they had to flee with whatever they could grab, run for safety, and ended up in Nepal, right? After a lot of work with the UN, since the 70s, Nepal said, you can't stay here. And they built refugee camps and they left them in refugee camps. Since the 1970s until the 2010, 2015 kind of range. So anybody in that group that was a kid when they fled was no longer a kid, right? They had grown up in a refugee camp. But they were stateless. Nepal would not claim them because even though they were ethnically ne Nepalese, they had grown up in Bhutan. <laughs> and so no one would claim them. They had no nationality. So that 10 million is the number of people in our world today that have no country that will claim them. 1,800, 189,000, sorry, and 300 people. That's the number of people um, who are resettled to any country as a refugee that um, is identified as a refugee among those 22.5 million. And um, less than 1% of those actually get to find a safe place to live because they can't go home and they can't stay where they're at that less than 1% go to the US or Sweden or Australia or Canada or any number of other countries that are willing to accept them. The number that came to the US last year is 85,000 out of that 189 that went anywhere in the world. So if you're a refugee, your chances of getting to a new country where you can actually get a job, own a house and raise your family in safety are pretty slim. Um, we'll go to the next slide. So all those statistics. And let me name the elephant. I, I'm, all, I'm just trying to share facts and, and then we're going to get into God's word. But I wanted to share a few stories first. Um, okay. Yeah, you are. <laughs> okay. Um, so I, I had the honor, um, when I worked at St. Vincent's, between five and 700 refugees came to Lansing, um, each of the years that I worked there, and I worked there almost three years. So I got to meet a lot of different families from a lot of different places. Where refugees are coming from shifts over time, depending on what's happening, and who the U.S. thinks is important to try to help at any particular time. And then I went to work at this amazing organization with kids. And refugee resettlement, I loved. I loved working there. The potlucks were the, I mean, we have awesome potlucks, but I have to say, when you can have Vietnamese food and Somali food and Indian food and American food, although some of the guys always said their wife made everything because they didn't cook. But, anyway. but I will forgive them that because the food was so good, right? I loved working there. But I loved working with the kids even more because I got to be in a relationship with them and know them for five years, 10 years, however long they were in the program. So that was really amazing. So I'm gonna tell some stories about people that I've known through each place. Um, but refugees have been my bosses, my coworkers, clients, um, and people that I would really come home to Corey and say, you sure I can't quit my job and we can just become foster parents and I can bring this kid home? And the answer is always no. We need a second income, and B, um, you know, it's kind of a conflict of interest. So it wasn't really professionally appropriate. It was just the urge of my heart in that moment, right? But so at my first place, my first boss um, at each place was from Vietnam. They were both refugees, and they both taught me a lot. But my first boss at Lutheran Social Services, which is now Samaritas. Um, they changed their name to be like the story of the Good Samaritan. But she came from Vietnam 
um, with her husband and her son in the 80s. Um, she had been in the U.S. a long time by the time I met her and got to work with her. Um, but her husband was tortured and put in a re-education camp because he had assisted the U.S. Um, during the Vietnam War. And she thought when they got to the U.S., everything was going to be great, right? And that wasn't necessarily the perfect outcome. But when she left Vietnam on a boat with her small child because there was no safe place for them in Vietnam and her husband had just re been released from the re-education camp and they had to go for fear that he would be back in there, right? Um, she had a degree in mathematics. She had a bag. And she said she actually... Have you seen the movies where in the Holocaust people put their jewelry in their bread and they swallowed it? She did that. She swallowed her most expensive jewelry so that she wouldn't lose it. Not knowing that in the boat, trying to flee, she was going to get seasick and she threw up all of her wealth into the ocean. So she came. She was a refugee for four or five years. I believe, before she was resettled. Um, she was prioritized because her husband had ties to the U.S. military, right? Um, so only took four or five years. Um, and her first job was at Burger King. She had a degree in mathematics and a family to help support, and she and her husband both took jobs doing, you know, making fast food, any job. She didn't care. Um, she started from scratch. She learned English. Um, she ended up with a job as an interpreter after a little while, um, and then went back to school and got a bachelor's degree and a master's degree in social work, because she was working interpreting for this agency that I then ended up working for, called Samaritas. So um, she bought a house, raised her family here, and, and is doing really well. And she taught me a lot. She taught me some difficult things she experienced as a refugee, and she taught me some funny things, right? Like the day um, when her son was a teenager and they were riding in the car and she said, see, he thinks I'm a great driver. Everybody walks around driving past me. They say I'm a number one driver. <laughs> and he said, mom, that's not what your middle finger means. <laughs> I'm just like, oh. So there are the challenging things and there are the funny things that I've experienced in my time working with refugees. I met a family of four from Bosnia when I worked at St. Vincent's. Um, so the former Yugoslavia was, is, which is, you know, Eastern Europe, right, was controlled by the communists after World War II. Um, religious beliefs and differences were oppressed um, historically. So it was okay to marry someone from a different ethnic group for a while. And then it became not okay, right? Um, so this family of four, and most of the Bosnians that we received in the late 1990s, um, were resettled when Bosnians fled, when there was a war, when the Serbians were killing the Croatians. Um, at that, and history's gone back and forth, right? Conflict has happened both ways. But at that point in time, the Serbians were killing the Croatians, and everybody ran. There's a horrible, good movie called the Land of Blood and Honey. It gives me nightmares, so I wouldn't recommend it, but if you want to see what was happening during that war, you could watch it, but it gave me nightmares. So it's very graphic, not for young children. Um, so people fled the conflict that was happening when their families were being murdered, when terror was everywhere for them. Um, and this particular family of four that I met um, fled when someone came into their house and abducted the husband, he was Croatian. So he was from the people being persecuted. And they took the wife, who was pregnant at the time, who was Serbian, because they were a mixed marriage, this wasn't okay. They imprisoned her in a basement of a nearby home, and they made him walk in front of the Serbian forces so that when there was fighting, he was a human bullet shield for them. They were separated for two years during the war. Um, and the wife told me about the first time her husband met their daughter after the war. And she didn't recognize him because she was two years old and she'd never met her dad. He came to the U.S. 
years after that, after being refugees for a long period of time and going through that process of clearances and vetting, he came to the U.S. with 16 bullet wounds in his body and limited use of one of his legs. He walked with a cane. Um, so he got medical help, but within four months, both he and his wife were employed. Um, they had another, a second baby by the time they got here, so they had two kids when I met them. Um, and after a few months, I matched them with a volunteer. My first job there was as a volunteer and resource coordinator, so I helped get apartments ready when people were coming, and then I helped find volunteers to help out. And I matched them with a volunteer because their daughter was having post-traumatic stress reactions to the fireworks over Lugnut Stadium because she thought there were bombs going off and that someone had chased them here. Uh, so I got a volunteer to work with them and help them adjust because they had a little bit of a tougher time with some of the trauma that they had been through. But they were both working and taking care of their family. At Samaritas, I worked with over 100 kids from South Sudan. So in less than five months of my first day, I started in September of 2000, less than five months, we had 100 kids come from South Sudan, and it was so much fun. As a case manager, it was awesome. I had all these kids I was case manager for. I knew every kid in the program, because even if they weren't mine, I was hired first before they hired the other people, as kids were coming before they hired the other case managers, so I got to know everybody. And about a year later, I got promoted to be a supervisor, so I got to know them all pretty well. But there are a few that are remarkable. There are a few whose stories are out there online that you can read and watch yourself. So one of those is Jacob Atem. For those that don't remember, does anybody remember the Lost Boys South Su of Sudan? Okay, so a few people. So there are some documentaries out there, 60 Minutes and other things, about this group of kids. So what would happen in South Sudan is in South Sudan, in the Dinka and Nuer and other tribal cultures, is the boys would go tend the cattle. That was their income, right, was having cattle. Um, so the boys, once you got to be six, eight, you watch the cattle. Mom and any of the girls are at home cooking your food because you're soaking your beans and your rice all day long, right, to cook it in Africa. One of the reasons that men didn't cook, I have learned, is it takes all day to cook. And if you're watching the cows, you can't cook at the same time. So um, maybe the husband is at home, maybe the husband is out with the cattle, maybe the husband's somewhere else. But all of these kids were separated from their parents because when bombs were dropping, the kids were miles away watching the cows. And the rest of the family was at home in the village. And when the bombs dropped, they ran. And many of them never found each other again. So there were 10,000 kids living in a refugee camp in Takuma in Kenya um, when I started this work, and they were identifying them for resettlement here because they had been refugees in Takuma, Kenya for almost 10 years. They left South Sudan, they ran on foot to Ethiopia, the Ethiopian, Ethiopian government decided they didn't want to host refugees, chased them out by guns across a river where many of them watched their friends die because they couldn't swim or because they got eaten by crocodiles. So back into South Sudan and then to, to Kenya where they lived for a long period of time in a refugee camp. So when those kids came here, they had a lot to learn and they're such an amazing group. You know, I worked with so many older teenage kids, some of the ones that I wanted to bring home. <laughs> Probably only a few years older than, a few years younger than me <laughs> actually at the time, but um, one of them, Jacob, who has all his stuff and has given me permission to share his name, has had his story um, published in the Lansing State Journal. Um, he's been in the New York Times and he's done a TEDx talk. So you can Google Jacob Atem and his story will come up. He graduated, he was placed with a foster family when he was 16 and he graduated from Weberville High School. Not too far away, huh? Um, he got to speak at their commencement ceremony um, he wasn't valedictorian or anything, but they chose him as a special speaker because of what he brought to their class and to their school. So he's a pretty awesome young man, but after he graduated from Weberville, he went on to graduate from Spring Arbor and with a bachelor's degree and a master's degree from Michigan State, and he's working on a PhD at the University of Florida right now. 
When he was at Spring Arbor, he started raising money and he started a nonprofit organization that opened a medical clinic in South Sudan when he was in graduate school. Some days I think I haven't accomplished much in my life um, because this kid, I shouldn't say, he's in his 30s, he's not a kid. <laughs> but you always think of someone when you met him, I guess. Um, but this young man is kind of amazing. Um, the New York Times article came out when he was back in South Sudan to monitor the medical clinic because he travels back and forth with his wife and fighting broke out and he said, I had to run to the bush just like when I was a kid. And it was so hard for him. And then he got on a plane to come back having US citizenship, right, at this point in time. And they said, you're Dinka, you're off the plane. They let his wife come back, but he looked too Dinka and they took him off the plane. And we weren't sure if he was gonna make it back at that point in time. And so those of us that knew him were praying and hoping he would make it back, which he did. And he has two lovely children now. Um, so he made it back a few weeks later after intervention from the US Embassy and others. Um, but he's doing amazing stuff. Um, and lots of the kids that came then are doing amazing things. And some of them are living in Lansing, I've seen, and just working full time and getting married and raising families just like the rest of us, you know? Um, I had two kids I worked with from the Congo, they were siblings, and their entire village was massacred. They're two of a handful of survivors of their village, period. Um, so the, if people have watched things about Rwanda and the genocide there, what happened when the R Rwandan genocide ended is some of those people that were doing the persecuting just moved into the Congo and continued their work and others that were there joined with them. So their parents, their grandparents, everybody died. And one of them said, the dead body is on top of me, saved my life. Because they shot into the pile of bodies and he survived because he wasn't at the top. His sister was raped and beaten, um, but survived as well. Although they both carry the scars of that trauma, they both eventually found each other and then made it here and were placed with the foster family. So some of the stories I have heard are difficult to hear. Um, some of them are a joy, it's like Jacob's, um, and some of them are just hard and they're heartbreaking. But I don't share them to kind of shock you or um, get that reaction. I share them because they're real people. So when we see the news, sometimes it seems like something that's far away and that doesn't concern us, but they're real people that God cares about. They have real families. What they're really seeking is a place to call home, a place that's safe, a place where they don't have to be afraid every day, a place where they can work and raise a family. And it takes years for them to get here. I have one other story to tell you. I had a, a youth who came from Iraq. So last week we heard a little bit about what's going on in Mosul from the doctor who came and spoke with our church. And um, he was placed with one of the most amazing foster parents I've met in my whole life. Um, if human cloning were okay, I would clone this man. Totally unethical, totally impossible, but he is awesome. Um, he's taken in over a dozen kids. His family portrait has four different continents represented in it. He's pretty cool. Um, but he fled from Iraq after his parents were murdered and he had to identify their dead bodies. And because they were fighting for democracy while Saddam Hussein was still in charge, his grandma gave him all her money and said, leave, it's not safe. He went to Lebanon and a Christian family took him in, a Christian family that was also a refugee that didn't have anything themselves. Um, and he decided in the two years that he lived with them to become a Christian because of how they responded, because of how they welcomed him. So he arrived in the US as a Christian, having grown up as a Muslim. And the only English he knew was, hello, father. Um, and I got to have lunch with him last year. He lives in the Detroit area, and he works a full-time job at a factory. He's a supervisor now. He's worked there since he was in high school um, in the summers. 
and he owns his own home. He actually didn't move out of his foster father's home until he was 23. So I don't know if that sounds like success when I say that, but um, he moved out and became a U.S. citizen. So he had a housewarming, I'm a U.S. citizen party when he was 23, which is pretty cool. And he changed his name to his foster dad's last name when he became a U.S. citizen because his parents and all of his family was deceased at that point. So I love seeing his posts, breakfast with dad every Saturday. Um, it's pretty amazing. His biggest challenge last year when we had lunch was um, that he really wanted me to help him meet some nice Christian girls about his age because he wants to get married and start a family and he hasn't met the right girl yet. And I thought, what an awesome normal problem. I love it. So um, all these people have come seeking safety just like our ancestors, right? Any of us that cannot claim Native American heritage, we're immigrants, right? At one point in time, whether it was Puritans like fleeing religious persecution or Irish coming for economic reasons. I mean, we all have heritage that is an immigrant story. And we celebrate Fourth of July this week and people that have defended our freedom. And that's what these refugees are seeking is a place to be free. I had names up there. I, I realize you probably can't read them now. Um, other refugees that have come in the past, right? Albert Einstein, Marlene Dietrich, Gloria Stefan, Anne Frank, Henry Kissinger, Madeleine Albright, Luol Deng, who's on the Mi Miami Heat. I don't know anything about sports. Um, Iman, who was the wife of David Bowie. Andy Garcia, um, Mikhail Baryshnikov, Mark Chagall, and Jesus. Jesus was a refugee. He had to flee. Um, when they were out to kill him, right? He and Mary and Joseph had to run and flee to Egypt or else he could have been killed. So I think it's powerful that God chose to incorporate that in Jesus' story. So go to the next slide. I need you guys to find a little scrap of paper around you, something that you don't want to take home with you. So if you have to grab a old scrap piece of paper from your Bible or a thing out of the front pocket or whatever you got to use, grab a scrap piece of paper. But I want us to take a minute and think, if all of a sudden we were refugees right here, right now, what would you take with you? If you faced the unimaginable, if you have to imagine in this moment, the unimaginable that you were a refugee and you had to flee your home right now, what would you take? I'm going to give you your family. You don't have to list your family. That's too hard. That's too hard. Assume that you get to take your family whole and intact, your kids and your parents and your siblings and everybody. What three things would you take with you? So I'm going to give you a minute. The enemy forces are approaching. You're, you're running out of time. What three things are you going to take with you? Do people have a list? It's hard to decide, isn't it? In that split second, what are you going to take with you? So, okay, you have to leave. What you've written down is what you have. If you didn't get to three, you didn't get three things, okay? You have to flee. And now what's happening is you're fleeing with your family. You're holding on to your kids or your parents or your sibling or someone. You're running with your best friend, whoever you're running with, you're running and you get to a river and you can't hold your stuff anymore. So hand it to your neighbor. Hand your list to your neighbor. If you don't have a neighbor, find one, Cory Baird. 
because I left him alone in the row. Okay. So now you've lost your list. Okay. Hold up the list. Who's got lists? Someone might not have lists because you passed it. Okay. Rip it up. Those things that were precious to you, maybe your photos of your family, your identification, anything to prove who you are, to prove that you went to college and that you're worthy of being employed somewhere. The food that you took so that you had something to feed your kids tonight as you're running. The blanket that you took so that you could keep them warm so that you didn't freeze. The money that you took because you wanted to start over or to have something to take with you. Your phone with the GPS so that you could find your way across the desert without dying. All of it's gone. Does anybody have their heart racing? Like when I have done this exercise, sometimes I get anxious. <laughs> like thinking of losing that stuff, what I wrote down. Just thinking of losing it, just imagining it, can make us feel a little anxious, a little sad, like, oh my gosh, you just stared up my thing. Um, but the refugees I've worked with have gone through this in real life, and it's unimaginable. Um, so I just wanted to give you guys a little thought. I, so we're going to look at what does God's word say and what does Jesus want us to do? Because that's what we're here. Not what does Diane think. I just wanted to give you facts and a few stories so that people are real for you, but what does God have to say? Go ahead. So you have some of these in your, your um, insert, in your bulletin insert, but what does the Bible say about refugees? So when I looked it up, I found a two-page list. The Bible is not quiet on the subject at all. Two-page list, and I was like, oh, what do I share? But I started at, you know, the, the Old Testament. The Old Testament says, Do not mistreat an alien or oppress him, for you were aliens in Egypt. When an alien lives with you in your land, do not mistreat him. The alien living with you must be treated as one of your native-born. Love him as yourself, for you were aliens in Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Leviticus. Cursed is the man who withholds justice from the alien, the fatherless, or the widow. Deuteronomy. Those verses speak powerfully from the Old Testament, don't they? Like, clear. Don't mistreat the alien. Welcome them. Love them as you would yourself. We were all, it reminds them that they were immigrants once, they were once fleeing Egypt. They were refugees from Egypt when they ran away and were chased by the Pharaoh's men under threat of death. They were being oppressed and slaves. A refugee story. Again. But we all have immigrant histories too. We live in a kind of amazing country, right? Where we're a nation of immigrants, except for the few among us that have Native American heritage. We were all immigrants a ways back. Next slide. I don't feel like I'm good about preaching. The parable of the sheep and the goats I didn't write out in Matthew, but if you guys remember that story, Jesus is saying, telling a story about the day of judgment. He's saying, those who helped the poor, those who helped the foreigner, those who helped the widow, those who helped um, those prisoners, when you have done that, you did that for me. On one side. And on the other side, he says, I didn't know you. You never helped me. You may think that you're righteous, but you didn't ever welcome me. You didn't treat me with love. It's a powerful story. Um, the story of the Good Samaritan. 
um, that we heard about a little bit last week as well. Um, the Good Samaritan story, right, is about someone helping a foreigner, a foreigner helping a Jewish person, someone that's a different religious background, someone that's a different cultural background that's hurt and left on the road, and it's dangerous to help them. This road is dangerous, but the Samaritan stops anyway. But what happens right before that story I think is profound. Um, the parable starts, an expert of the law asks Jesus the question in verse 25, Teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus' answer is, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your strength and all your mind. So love God. And love your neighbor as yourself. So Jesus says these are the two important things, right? It echoes what's said in the Old Testament. And the man, like us, we question Jesus, right? We don't always want to take... He keeps it simple. Love God. Love your neighbor. We're the ones that question, right? He says, who's my neighbor? Who do I have to treat as my neighbor? And Jesus tells the story of showing love to someone that's from a different culture, a different religion, a different background, someone that he has never met before. So everyone is our neighbor, right? So the context gives us everything. Jesus gives us a simple answer, but we, we always, you know, want to do the least amount possible. So Jesus clarified, everyone is your neighbor. You can't just say those people are my neighbor. Um, also, it says, if anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? Dear children, let us not love with words or tongue, but with actions and in truth, 1 John. And there is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear. Because fear has to do with punishment. One who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love you, God, and hates his brother, he is a liar. God doesn't mince words. For anyone who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. Also 1 John. So in my feelings of inadequacy to share God's word, I came across this video clip that I think does a much better job than I ever could, than I want to share with you. The question of how to treat migrants and refugees is making headlines these days. It's a contemporary question. It's also an old question, which is addressed many times in the Jewish and Christian traditions. So it's worth asking, what does the Bible say about how we're supposed to treat refugees, migrants, and foreigners? Well, it's pretty clear, and it starts all the way back in the book of Exodus. God tells Moses, and through him the whole people of Israel, you shall not oppress the resident alien among you. You know the heart of an alien, for you were aliens in the land of Egypt. That's two messages from God. First, care for the refugee. In the ancient Near East, as outsiders, people without an attachment to a clan, foreigners were vulnerable and often poor, just like migrants and refugees today. So they needed special help. Second, God is reminding the Israelites that they were themselves aliens once, when they were in exile in Egypt. The Old Testament reminds us of this in Exodus, Leviticus, and Deuteronomy. In fact, the book of Deuteronomy says that God loves the stranger. Psalm 146 echoes this, saying, the Lord protects the stranger. The Hebrew scriptures remind us of two essential things. First, God's command to care for refugees, migrants, and aliens. Second, God's special love for them. In case we missed the point, in the book of Kings, King Solomon directs his people to pay attention to the foreigner who does not belong to your people, Israel, but has come from a distant land. And what are we to do? Solomon says, do according to all that the foreigner calls you to. In other words, answer any need that the migrant or refugee has. Jesus is even stronger about this in the New Testament. In the parable of the Good Samaritan from the Gospel of Luke, Jesus tells the story of a Jewish man going from Jerusalem to Jericho and who is robbed and beaten. As he's lying by the side of the road, two people pass by, a priest and a Levite, both from the man's own religious group. They were probably afraid to stop. The road to Jericho, which still exists, was notoriously dangerous and prone to robbers. Finally, a Samaritan man stops to help. Samaritans were the traditional opponents of the Jews, outsiders. Notice that the Samaritan doesn't care about the danger, or maybe he does and helps the man anyway. Jesus reminds us that we're called to help the stranger even if there's risk involved. 
Jesus doesn't say help the stranger only if it's risk-free or only if it's convenient or only if that person is from the same religious group as you. No, Jesus says show mercy to the stranger regardless. He's also saying that just like the beaten man, our own salvation may depend upon a stranger. In fact, Jesus says that the way we treat strangers will be a litmus test for entrance into heaven. At the last judgment, he'll say to some people, I was a stranger and you didn't welcome me. And some people will answer, Lord, when did we see you as a stranger and not help you? And he will say that every time you didn't help a stranger, you didn't help me. That's the way it will be decided who enters heaven, says Jesus. And just in case you think that this only applies to individuals, the traditional name for this passage in the New Testament might help. It's called the judgment of the nations. Perhaps the strongest message from Jesus is not what he said, but what he did. After his birth, Mary and Joseph take Jesus from Israel to Egypt. Were there border guards and passports during what's called the flight into Egypt? No. But Mary and Joseph and their son were fleeing persecution and the threat of death at the hands of King Herod. So using the contemporary definition, we can say that among all the refugees that our world has seen were Mary, Joseph, and Jesus. Brian always leaves us with something we can do or something we need to do. Um, if you want to learn more, there are lots of great places to find out more. Um, some of my favorites are up on the screen, but they're kind of small. So World Relief is a Christian organization that does um, relief around the world. Um, they have uh, two books that they've published on the topic of refugees, Seeking Refuge and um, Standing with the Vulnerable. And the first one, Seeking Refuge, has a seven-day devotional that you can download as well. Um, Samaritan's Purse that we heard about a lot last week, another great organization that's doing work with refugees, um, has great information as well. Church World Service, another um, Christian organization doing a lot here and overseas. Um, the RefugeeProject.org is that one site that I mentioned that has the really cool map. The United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, so UNHCR, is where I got my most up-to-date statistics because that's where I could find the numbers from 2016. Um, MigrationPolicy.org has facts about economic security and all that stuff. So it's not Christian, but it does is a place that has facts. Don't look for your Facebook feed to give you accurate information, right? Facebook gives you more of whatever you like. So whatever you like, you're going to see more of it um, and not always an accurate source of information. Um, pray for refugees. Now that you understand a little bit more about what people go through, you know, I hope you have compassion and want to pray for them, um, whether they ever get a chance to be resettled or not, here or somewhere else. But you can also get involved. There's foster parenting. Samaritas.org is that site. You can mentor or tutor a family um, at St. Vincent Catholic Charities. SPVCC.org is the Lansing organization. I didn't write down the Ann Arbor one, but if you're closer to Ann Arbor, there's a Jewish family services that does refugee work in Ann Arbor as well. Um, those are two closest places locally. Um, so they take, all those places take donations of stuff to help people set up new apartments and they look for mentors, right, to help that new family figure out how to ride the bus and do you shop at Meyer or do you shop at Aldi or do you shop at QD on the corner, what's your least expensive? So teaching people kind of like those basics, right? or just being a friend so they don't feel so isolated. Um, a lot of the Southern Sudanese um, identified with the Episcopal Church um, and the Lutheran Church, so we had to you know, say, where do you feel comfortable? And then after they got here and started attending churches, then they found also which congregations came around them and supported them and formed groups. Um, so connecting people with places, that's what mentors do, tutors. Um, Obviously, any of those groups on the left, I'm sure take money. I'm not here to ask you for anything, so, but if anybody feels compelled, there, there are places. And if you want to advocate for humane policies um, or biblical policies, you can do that. Locally, there's a group called MichiganImmigrant.org that works on the state legislature. There has been stuff that's anti-immigrant and anti-refugee proposed in the state um, this year and last year, so they have information about that if you're interested. 
and nationally, LIRS, which is Lutheran Immigration and Refugee Service, another faith-based, has like advocacy stuff about DC and other places do as well. World Relief and um, Samaritan's Purse and Church World Service probably do as well. Um, Refugees.org is a non-faith-based organization, but they have lots of good information too. Um, so I would encourage people to take action or examine your heart and examine what God has said. If I have offended you because I didn't deliver right, I hope you will forgive me. If God's gospel has offended you, then that's okay. I've made my peace with that. <laughs> um, so I have one more slide. Um, so there is that service opportunity. If you didn't sign up and you're interested, there's a graduation party. This is a painting a mural that was painted by some of the refugee youth in Lansing about their journey. Um, so you can see their journey where it started at the bottom left corner, it's dark um, and it was dangerous and they left on foot and there were borders, there was um, barbed wire, there was water to cross, there are tombstones, if you can see it close enough, of people they lost on the way. Um, and when they found their way to the U.S., as they depicted, when we said, kids, why don't you make a painting about your journey? They made a picture of light and hope and added the U.S. flag in. They weren't given any guidance. This is their painting. Um, and they put words in there like love and hope and faith. Um, and those are the ones that I can read in English or Spanish. I can't read the other languages. And follow your dreams. Um, so even though I've left that organization, I you know, will always have a place in my heart for the kids that are there and celebrating their accomplishments. Some of them have foster parents that can't afford to offer them an open house. Um, and some of them have moved out and live in an apartment now and aren't gonna throw their own open house, right? They're just trying to pay their bills each month while they work. So this party that is held every June or July, this year on July 21st, is to offer that to them so that they can, any graduate can invite two friends. So it isn't an open house, open house, but it's an opportunity that they can invite some friends um, to celebrate their graduation with them and for the organization and foster families to celebrate their accomplishment. It's not easy if you get here at 16 knowing no English to graduate from high school. It's a big accomplishment. Um, and so that's a service opportunity coming up if people are interested. Um, there's VBS soon, I would say, you know, expressing our love and God's love to our neighbors around us is what I hear most from the gospel. Love God and love your neighbor. So VBS is another great way to love your neighbor. But I've talked to Pastor Brian and I'd like to organize more opportunities for us to do service projects and love our neighbor in a real way so if anybody else is interested, I'd love other people to brainstorm with me and find other ways, like in Stockbridge, maybe with the outreach or outside Stockbridge sometimes. You know, I want my kids to grow up knowing that serving other people is important. And it's not all about us. So I'd want them to be able to do that as they grow up. So I invite anybody that's interested to join me in brainstorming. And then if we can set some things up, you know, after August is over, and invite other people when you're able to join, maybe once a month in doing something in our community or outside of it to show God's love. Thank you. <laughs>